How is it going, boys and girls? Welcome back to Key West Waterman. My name is Aaron Young. What a beautiful day. Uh, I didn't honestly have any intention of coming out today, but as you can see, I'm not on my boat. You've, do you've met Justin quite a few times. We've got a few new faces. We've got Dan Yar, Maddie, and JR. Um, but Justin's boat has been in the shop. He actually has the same boat that I do. He just had it completely redone. You can see it's nice and shiny. And uh, he gave me a call and said, hey, I want to take the boat out. Let's go do some diving. I figured maybe we can put a few scratches in it. But um, realistically, we really don't have an agenda. Just kind of coming out to go diving. And I figured I would bring you guys along. Maybe you could use an escape from reality. We are going to get suited up and hop in. Let's go. Uh, you want your belt, Chief? Welcome back underwater, everybody. As you can tell, probably the current is absolutely ripping. The boat is anchored, and those you can see the prop spinning. That is strictly from current. Uh, we're having to breathe up on the back of the boat and dive straight down as quickly as we could. It was kind of strange because there was only 10 to 15 feet on the surface where the current was really cranking. And then once you got under it, it was dead still. Um, but to save you a bunch of boring dives, we hit probably four spots over a span of two hours. Uh, we really didn't see much at all. I think Dan Yar saw one black grouper off in the distance. Um, didn't really get a shot on it. I did... 18, 20 dives and didn't even pull the trigger. It just, there wasn't a lot of life. I had been diving all week and it was pretty good and uh, not a whole lot of current. And it was this day, the current picked up and the fish kind of just either moved or went deeper. Some, something was different and there just wasn't, wasn't a whole lot going on. Is it a tree root? It kind of looks like a tree. I'm getting in the water. So we were moving spot to spot and I noticed something on the horizon just looked irregular so we went over to check it out. Turns out it was and you'll see shortly, it is a giant tree flipped upside down and the root system is up, kind of poking out of the water. And if you're unfamiliar, if you find anything of size, especially something that's partially submerged out in the ocean, it is always gonna hold life. I mean, you can see we're two, 300 feet from the, the, the root and there is just bait everywhere. Um, this is pretty much standard throughout the world in my findings. Anytime you find what we call a floater way out in the ocean, it's going to have life on it. And a lot of times, wahoo or mahi, other predators, with all those, with all that bait, it's only natural that predators are going to pile up there as well. You can just see the amount of life here. Truly unbelievable. This alone was worth the, the entire trip. We rarely see this. I think in my life I found maybe a handful of trees. The tree is the ultimate find because it has surface structure and it also is submerged down underwater um, and everything just congregates to it. I, I don't understand completely why. It just floats through the ocean and over time it slowly um, picks up life and more action brings more action and this thing has been floating for quite some time to have this amount of life on it. Wahoo! Wahoo! So as you can see, we're approaching the stump. I see a wahoo come in. This is very rare for the summertime to see wahoo. Uh, finding a big floater like this is about the only time you'll see them unless you really spend the time floating and looking for them, which it can be um, very boring. And, I line up and I am well within range of this thing and I take a shot and it misses and you can watch this and it's gonna sound like an excuse watch this shot my shaft goes high and right 
Um, it does not go in a straight line from the direction of the track. I barely nick the back of the wahoo. Uh, I was well within range. I was less than 10 feet from that fish. And in my head, I knew that I hit it. I knew that I made the good shot and it just didn't, it didn't stick. How in the hell? And of, of all the things, you know, that could have gone wrong. I just recently had a gear malfunction with a flopper. And I didn't realize it yet, but I had been running charters all week. And I actually bent this shaft a few days prior. And I hadn't used my gun since then. And I forgot to change the shaft. I had a spare shaft on the boat. I brought it with me in the morning. I just forgot to change it. Um, and in my head right now, I just cannot figure out how or why I missed that fish. So I load my gun and I'm going to try and shoot one of these rainbow runners as chum. A lot of times you can use them as a throw flasher. If there's this much life, I'm thinking there's going to be other wahoo around. And I take a shot at this thing point blank and I go, how on earth did I miss the rainbow runner that close? And I look at the shaft and I realize. I just remembered this is that bent shaft that I never changed. Which of all the things that I could have lined up and figured that out on, <laughs> Wahoo was probably the last. I mean, even if I would have shot at a mangrove or a mutton earlier in the day, I would have realized the shaft was bent and I, I would have changed it. And it's just the timing of that was um, a little funny. You just can't help but look back and laugh at it. But we floated for a while. And I just kind of sat there and just wanted to enjoy this. Like, we rarely see this. You can see the amount of life on it. It's just really an incredible thing to experience. It does not happen very often, especially to find a tree. A lot of times it's a bundle of rope or a piece of debris, but a tree is kind of the ultimate floater. So after I sat on the water and chill cried for a little while, um, I actually hopped out of the water to change my... I had grabbed a different gun, um, and I hopped back out of the water, and Justin stayed for a few more minutes. And another Wahoo came in. And Justin's got a little bit bigger of a gun, so he's got more range. And he takes a shot and he hits it. It was a decent shot, maybe like an inch high, a little above the spine. Yeah, I hit him. But um, with these Wahoo, they're very soft. I prefer a slip tip if I have one. Yo! Where are these guys at? I hit that Wahoo. So you can see he's hollering for me. I wasn't in the water. I obviously heard him hollering and I jumped in the water uh, to try and put a second shot in it. And with using a flopper instead of a slip tip, you really have to baby it. It's a mackerel. Mackerel are very, very soft. Uh, you can see this thing just peel and line out. And uh, unfortunately, he worked it for a few minutes. I hopped in and unfortunately the fish tore out. So we went 0 for 2 on Wahoo in the summertime. It was pretty painful. Definitely not ideal, but it happens. I cannot believe that. Look at the tip. Mm -hmm. You might be able to vice it out. I brought, I, I knew it was bent. I brought another shaft to change it and I just forgot to change it. And of course I, I couldn't have shot at a grouper earlier to tell me that. The camera probably doesn't pick this up and it sounds like I'm making an excuse, but... No, it's definitely bad. It is very clearly bad. Yeah, definitely. How did that even happen? In a rock or something? <sighs> nah, it was a, little, it was a grouper in a rock. It just barely yeah, yeah, tweaked yeah. it. And I, yeah. I, I literally brought the shaft to change it and I just forgot to change it. We we never see Wahoo in the summertime. John, you want to shoot one right. of those rainbow and, runners? Um, They're good eating. I would have shot That was just a missed earlier. opportunity. We weren't looking for that Wahoo. You want to shoot one or no? You know what the rainbow runners look like? They're Life like, goes on, right? Those are good eating. That's right, yeah. They're good sashimi. <laughs> so I'm going to level with you. We are on what we like to call the struggle bus. We've hit how many spots? Like six or seven probably? Yeah, something like that. Probably like six or seven spots. We've seen maybe two black groupers that were just kind of way out. We're not having it. No mutton snappers. One or two mangroves. Um, not all rainbows. It's just not uh, It's not happening today. So we're going to mix it up, head a little shallower, and maybe check some coral heads or something. See what we can run into. So as I said, we uh, kind of had our tail between our legs. No grouper. Saw two wahoo struck out. 
So we decided to mix it up. What we were doing wasn't working on the deep side of the reef, so we decided to go into the shallows. And just plug around, check some coral heads. I mean, just see what, what if anything, was around at this point. We're just kind of looking for dinner and see some short mangroves and short hogfish. Um, really enjoy these coral heads. Lots of life. They're just kind of isolated on top of the reef. Uh, I have quite a few of them marked. Uh, between drifting coral heads, nice mutton comes in and Justin gets a shot. At this point, we have like, I think, a 21 inch red grouper in the boat, um, maybe one tiny yellow jack. Just, we don't even have enough to feed the people that are on the boat. So, this was a pleasant sight to see. Justin got a nice mutton. Holy crap, it's a fish. It's nice, a real one. Would you believe that it was a fish? The ocean has given us a lesson today. I think I'm going to try and plug some lionfish. A lot of you guys have been asking about the lionfish episode, so maybe I'll do that. Just not, not seeming to be working. So we start plugging around, and I start to see a decent amount of lionfish, so I decide, hey, I love lionfish. Why not? I'm going to plug a few. Um, if you're not familiar, they are invasive down here. I say it again in the video later, but they are invasive. We're encouraged to kill the ones we do see. And they're delicious, so why not? And I don't treat them any different than I would treat any other fish, um, even though they are invasive. Brain and bleed as always. These actually, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't notice a huge difference in the meat quality. Uh, as far as bleeding, I brained for humanity. Just, you really have to be careful. Their spikes on their back is where they contain their, um, I guess it's venom. Oh, there's like a 40 pound black. What? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> we had hopped in on another coral head. Just wanted to mess with Justin there a little bit. So I use a little different method here you probably haven't seen me do um, as far as harvesting lionfish. Normally you want a catch bag or a lionfish keeper or something like that. But you really have to be careful with this because if they sting you, it hurts. Trust me, I've been, I've been poked by one. It is not a pleasant experience. Um, you can see there's quite a few in this rock. I dove this a few days earlier with some clients um, and just remembered which one it was and decided we'd go back and clean it up. So I'm gonna use my spear gun setup as kind of my stringer. I've got my three prong. Three prong's a lot easier. I just wanted to unload the gun. Um, so again, very carefully. So I'm gonna break apart my gun, lock the reel down so the line doesn't keep coming out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna brain this one as always. But you'll see, I use my spear and line as my stringer. So what I did was I took that lionfish off, strung it through its jaw, and then pushed it back towards the gun. The gun's 15 feet behind me because that's how much shooting line I have. Uh, and you'll see here, a lot easier, a lot more effective with a three prong. You don't have to reload and unload your gun every time. And I'm just using my shaft and my line as my stringer. When time is of the essence, this can be very helpful. So now my, as I'm diving and moving around, that lionfish is working itself back. Um, and I do have another shot of it. You can see I swim up, slides back, and you'll see the, the initial lionfish. Now it's back towards my gun. And it just gives me a little separation so I can work with these and uh, try to avoid getting those spines in me. Yeah, there's more in there. Spent the time and cleaned this rock up and made it lionfish free. I had plenty of meat for ceviche. A whole bunch of fun on that thing. Just grab the gun, I'll grab the. 
Man, I forgot how much fun that is. Well, it should be perfect for the late uh, afternoon fish coming out. So we actually put a couple fish in the boat. Hold on, what is beeping? Yelling at me. We've really been on the struggle bus today, but um, popped a few lionfish. And if you're not familiar with what these are, they're an invasive species. They are venomous, not poisonous. So if they, their spikes, um, their spines get get into you, uh, it hurts like I'll get out, but it will not kill you. But shouldn't kill you unless you're allergic. But um, grabbed a few of these to eat. Um, they are invasive. We're encouraged. We're encouraged to kill all of them. The ship has kind of sailed uh, as far as eradicating them but we're encouraged to kill them mm -hmm. and uh, it's convenient because they are also very delicious yeah. to eat so i grabbed a few we'll eat some of those um i think we're gonna hit one more spot justin's in the water um he really wants a grouper to eat so we're gonna give a grouper one more go but we've got a couple fish for dinner now at least Six. Uh, i've been to this spot a bunch and there's a big grouper that lives here and um I've had some clients take swipes at them and never have been able to connect, so I'm going to give it a look. So we wanted to give it one last two raw. It's really not often we go out and um, get skunked on groupers. It was just a strange day. There just wasn't a lot around. The conditions had changed pretty drastically overnight, like I had mentioned. Um, so we went a little shallower. This was one of my spots that I brought with me. And I know this rock really well. I've seen, there's one big grouper that lives here, very elusive. Um, and I'd actually like to cover cave diving one day, um, like cave spearfishing. If that's something you guys are interested in, let me know. And I pause the clip here and you can barely where my light is seeing, see a black blob and it slides back. And I'm pretty sure this was the big one. The big one on this spot is very smart, very shifty. I've personally had maybe two shots on him, but it was when I was with clients and I didn't want to take it. I wanted them to take it, but this fish is very smart. It knows what it's doing. I've seen him probably at least a dozen times. And you can see right when the light hit him, he slid back. If you have to, go watch that clip again. But um, kind of to jump back. If you'd like to see, I can't remember what I said. If you'd like to see uh, some cave spearfishing, a specific episode on that, I'd love to cover it. So just leave a comment, let me know. And I took probably five or six dives. This this rock kind of reminds me of the Bahamas. It's a lot of caves and cracks. There's a lot of area for these fish to move around. Just a big, nice piece of structure. Um, and I spent probably five or six dives trying to locate uh, a different grouper. I knew this one wasn't the big one, but I could see its face. It was kind of sitting still, which made me realize it wasn't the big one. If you look in here, if you're on a big screen, you may be able to barely just see this fish's lips tucked way inside there uh, and this is hole hunting it's one of my favorite things to do it's very tactical um, it's just like a puzzle it really gets me going I really enjoy it so I've got my eyeball on it I'm pretty sure I can get him out but I kind of want a second opinion so I, I asked Dan Yard to take a look I think I'll get him out of there. <laughs> can I see that light yeah I can see his face I'm not gonna shoot him no, no you're good I'm, I, I can see his face I don't know if that's the big one this one kind of looks a little smaller You think it'll fit? That's I what I was kind of thinking. I can't tell how big you it is. get the angle with a shaft. Because it's going to be in his head, so it should be able to turn him. You can get that fish out for sure. <laughs> I just wanted someone else to say it, because normally I'm a, a little, no, you can get normally I'm a little unreasonable. You so you could hear, I don't know if you could hear the conversation well there, but I just wanted someone else to tell me I could get the fish out. I thought I could. I just didn't want to be the guy to go down there, shoot a fish, and then we're stuck there for an hour and a half. So, nice to have a second set of eyes on it and look at it and tell me that I could get the fish out. Um, in all my years, I've actually left one fish in a rock ever. I drove all the way home, borrowed someone's scuba gear, drove back out, and I still couldn't get it out. That's how stuck it was. And it wasn't because um, I shot in the rock. It was I shot the fish, and it swam into a rock, and I couldn't get it out. Anyways, um, I normally don't take irresponsible shots, is my point. Kind of rambling. But you can see trying to just line this up flashlight straight down the shaft and doing my best to not hit a rock it's a very small window there and you can see I don't do anything I want this fish to come forward I want it to 
to go past the flopper. So I see its face and I can see the shaft in my line, how close it is. I know it's past the flopper, so I just shift the shaft over a little so it doesn't bend my shaft. Come back up for air um, so I can try and pull them out on my next dive. Not thrilled about it. Uh, you no, are he's, not. Not. he's not. <laughs> A lot of people's instinct when they shoot into a hole is to immediately pull on the shaft. And in certain situations, it can be okay, but when you're shooting into a tight hole where there's backdrop, that the shaft is gonna stop. I want to either push the shaft forward or I wanna let the fish work itself up because when it tries to leave, a lot of times it's gonna go past the flopper. You just wanna make sure that um, it's past that flopper. And I've talked about the importance of headshots in holes, and this is an example as, as to why. If I hit that fish mid-body, I'm not gonna be able to squeeze him out of that rock because I have his head, I can make him almost perpendicular to the shaft, get my hand behind him and turn. Uh, you can see how easily he actually came out. And this was pretty wild. Someone had, within the past week or so, taken a shot and hit the belly of this fish. Somebody else took a shot on that fish? Recently, look at that. Would you believe that? Someone else, someone else shot him, look at that. Poor guy. Swimming around with his guts out. Sorry, buddy. Hold on. Would you believe it? We found a black river. Then someone else already shot. I don't know that I've seen one with a wound like that. Like that was pretty hefty. Like his guts were hanging out. Dude, that was not Here, the fish that we saw when we rolled over. No way. I saw his belly. That's the whole thing. I was like, his belly was fat. That's not the big one that I've, no. that I've seen before. The other one's up county is 20 pounds, but that's a, that's a healthy fish. That should be enough for you to eat, right, Justin? That'll be work. That'll be enough. I just want the cheeks. We are done out here. We had to work for that one. Yes, we did. All day. Oh, God. We're done out here. We'll see you at the dock. Good work, man. Oh, shoot. So the meal we're gonna have tonight, all I'm gonna need is the cheeks. Um, Justin, it's his boat, he wanted the grouper, so I'm gonna let him have the grouper. Not let him have, he gets the grouper. Um, but I'm just gonna take the cheeks out of it. I've done this before, but the recipe we're doing tonight just requires cheeks. And I've showed you this in the past, but I'll show you again, just in case those of you are new and have not seen it. Just kinda open it up. Use that knife and follow it around. I pick the dullest knife that I have. You just kind of work it back. And you're gonna score it straight through to the skin. Once you get to the skin. Peels right off. And that is our dinner. Would you like a grouper spider? Yes, please. We are back in the kitchen. And obviously these are all not all from today. These are all grouper cheeks. I've been I've had quite a few charters this week, so I've been saving these grouper cheeks. Uh, if you've never had grouper cheeks, they're kinda like the filet mignon of the fish. So when my clients don't take them, I save them, stock them up, and we make um, grouper sliders. So what you're gonna need, Madeline's making a sauce. I cannot remember for the life of me if we've done this before. We may have, if we did, I apologize. And if you're new to the channel, hopefully you enjoy. Uh, pretty much it's mayo, and it's not a recipe, you kinda just eyeball it. Mayo, probably, what do you think? 10 parts mayo, two parts mustard? Yeah, yeah. One to five, rather? Yeah. I was gonna say 10 to one, but I think it's 
probably closer. You want to have the tank on the mustard one. a little bit, and then so. you just kind of mix it and taste it. Mayo. We'll little, show you little, the bit, little bit of yellow mustard. It's not much, and then you add lime, mix it up, and taste it. Lettuce. Uh, Hawaiian rolls. And I'm gonna show you how I fry my cheeks here. <clears throat> Most of my fried fish I double batter. The cheeks I single batter. Well, not always. I'm feeling lazy right now. So just egg wash, and this is actually panko and seasoned breadcrumb mix. Oh, that panko didn't stick very well on that one. And here we are. And if you've never had one of these, and you get a chance to try them, in a restaurant. Grouper cheeks, literally, they're, they're a different texture than the rest of the fish. They're very soft, very delicate um, compared to the rest of the fish, excuse me. Kind of had a thought there, but uh, we're gonna fry these up, get our sauce going, and very simple but delicious recipe. You could do this with other fried fish. Doesn't have to be the cheeks. We just like the cheeks because they're the shape of the bread. <laughs> Anyways, I'm rambling. See you in a sec. Yeah, I like crunchies. So golden brown. This is pretty similar to how I fry the rest of my fish. Normally I do a normally I do a double coat. I go egg wash, uh, breadcrumb, egg wash again, panko. But I'm, like I said, lazy tonight doing single. And putting these out on a rack makes the world of a difference. It allows air to get on both sides. And um really allows that fish to crunch up. Look at that. Perfect. Oh, these look amazing. Eat up our, I like Hawaiian rolls. I know they're terrible for you, but I'm a big fan. A little bit of sauce. A little bit of lettuce. And again, you can do this with any fish. Just the sliders, it's almost like they were meant to be. <laughs> or the, the cheeks, rather. And careful, because these cheeks hold heat like no other. And there you are, nice and simple and delicious. A lot of the restaurants down here are starting to carry grouper cheeks on the re on the menu, so you get a chance. Mm. Babe, you have it in your beard. Do I? <laughs> all over. <laughs> That's all right. Didn't need to flash the camera. That's all right. Mmm. <laughs> so refreshing. Just a nice very basic, simple snack. But that is all we've got on this one. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, I can't remember if we did this, if we did already. It was just as good as the first time, so. But as always, thanks so much for your time. Really do appreciate it. Leave a comment. Be sure to hit the like button. If you did enjoy the video, I can't, don't think I've said that in a while, but I'll see you all in the next one. See ya. <laughs>